You know, factory farming is, is a new phenomenon. And you, 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 uh, if you haven't really become aware of it, it it's not surprising because it snuck up on us. In 1992, 30% of pigs in the US were kept on a factory farm. By 2016, it was over 97%. Um, chickens, there were 13 billion chickens in uh, 1993, twice as many, over 27 billion by 2016. And over 50% of the fish we consume today are factory farmed. Now, you know, a lot of us talk about um, curing symptoms when we're talking about factory farms. They're talking about, well, we need to make, you know, the, well, let me tell you the consequences of factory farms as well. So th these are weapons of mass destruction. Um, there are four inconvenient truths about them. There's human health, there's, a uh, there's the planet and its resources, and um, there's uh, climate change, which is what we're going to talk about, and food security. So in terms of human health, I don't know if you know, but 80%, 80% of all antibiotics in the US are used on factory farms and uh, it's over 50% in Europe. And we're not told about this because the, the farmer is saying it doesn't transfer from animals to humans. And, um, um, and of course, the other side is when you're eating the stuff, you, you are what you eat. And in terms of food security, well, food security in a second, but planet's resources, um, it takes 1,000 liters of water to get 100 calories from a cow, it takes uh, 37 liters of water to get uh, 100 calories from potatoes. 91% of the Amazonian deforestation is as a result of livestock production. So, you know, they, they're doing deforestation to grow soya, one of the biggest products now on the planet. But 85% of soya is used uh, to feed the animals. So, one of the in one of the key points, I think, that um, nobody seems to realize is, how did this start? And this started because of the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution was, um, was in the four, late 40s, 50s, where we discovered or invented chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides, and new wheat strains. And the result of that was there was a huge abundance of cereals starting in the US because of all these new ways of, of growing cereals. But the farmers were going bust. So what did they do? Well, if we've got so much cereals, and by the way, we've just discovered antibiotics, why not bring animals that feed off pastures, it's ubiquitous, they eat grass, cows. Why not bring them into feedlots and why not uh, bring other animals into cages and um, we can feed them cereals and then they can, um, they can, they can, uh, we can get our food supply that way and get rid of our cereals that way. And what's happened is that What's happened is that um, starting in the mid-80s, animals start out-demanding out humans for cereals. It's grown by over, um, the numbers will be wrong if you see them, but uh, directionally right. The planet, well, agricultural space has increased since the um, 50s to by a by 8%. The population has grown 130, 160%. Cereals for humans, 130%. And cereals for animals, other, anim other animals, 230%. And where we're going in the future is that um, this is continuing to double. So by 2050, it should grow by 74%. 
we don't have enough planet's resources to feed all these animals. Coming back to climate, why do, how can we just feed cereals to cows and um, when they, all they eat is grass? Well, you can give them hormone treatment. They, eat the gr they can then eat the cereals, but they still create more greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases coming onto climate is more than the whole transport sector. I mean, because, you know, they, they fart a lot more <laughs> because of um, they're eating cereals, which they're not used to. And um, so that's the cause of the Green Revolution. And so what can we do about it? And you, it, we, Nick was talking this morning about changing systems as opposed to you know, making an impact rather than a difference. And sh shall I carry on? Or, uh, well, I think, I think we've got the general picture. I mean, yeah. just, just to try and summarize, um, meat and dairy production accounts for about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's the major a driver of land use change, biodiversity loss. It's quite an increasingly water-hungry way of producing food, and it's contributing to a whole host of other problems. And people like Jeremy are trying to do something about it. And, and I think it would be really, really interesting to find out a bit more about what you're doing in your role as an investor in trying to affect change. So, so I, I started out as a pension guy investment manager and and then started a business found a um, 20 billion under management now I own it but and um, I, 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 I four years ago I died four years ago in the sense that a friend asked if he could write my obituary and and I said well, why would you want to do that and I, and I said I'd like to live happy to a hundred and I gave him purpose, love, health, and gratitude as my ingredients. And, so, and I said, as long as it's totally private to me, thank you very much, um, we'll do it. And so he, he, he wrote it and spent the weekend in Verbier skiing. And he said to me, actually, you die tomorrow. And you're very rich. And you pioneered and led an industry in, in this particular asset class. And you're a total bore. And he said, I've got another one here. You don't die at 100, you die at 98, and you're the most amazing 98-year-old. And, and he put down that I have a business school. I, my business continues growing great. You know, Scott was talking this morning about um, what do you do if, you, if you're part-time at something, and I'll get to that in a second. But he said, um, then he said, I have a business school named after me, and that um, I change pension policy in Africa. You know, I have a passion for pensions because it creates economic vibrancy. It, 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 it's, it allows, in terms of social security, it allows individuals to not be dependent on their par not to be dependent on, not their parents not being dependent on their children as they grow old, and, and, and it allows capital to be built. And, but more importantly, in a way, it provides long-term capital for a country. Um, and which is very, very an economic vibrancy, which is very, very powerful, and um, and the and so um, so and I thought I'm there. I'm on 98. I'm on my deathbed, and I think to myself honestly, you know, that wouldn't be authentic for me. But if I could save a few cows from a concentration camp, I'd be, you know, proud of myself. And so we put down a business school and um, and. Uh, uh, and that he put down, because he, he put that I invent animal factory farming, but you know, he, <laughs> it's, um, and, but the, the power of that, having a, having a stake in the ground of where you're going to be, and incredibly authentic for me, I was a vegetarian at 12, I was a bystander because I didn't do bad as I saw it, because I became a vegetarian at 12 because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't believe in the way some animals were brought up, but I didn't know which ones, and I was 12 years old, so I thought I'll go the whole way until I'm older, and then stayed vegetarian. And, and so, you know, now that I'm an upstander, it's a great word, upstander, you know, switching from being not doing harm to being active. Um, so, so we wrote that down, and then, you know, how the hell does anyone make any difference at all as an individual? And, and so I'm a pension investor, 
But something's happened in the pension world. Investors are saying, um, uh, investors are saying we need, when we invest in a Bangladeshi textile factory, we need to make sure there's a fire exit and foundations because it's good business. They're saying, what is the point of having a pension in, in 2050 if the temperature is 120 degrees? And so what we've done is start a movement called uh, a hub, which is about materiality, not morality, fair farm animal investment risk and return, which bridges the knowledge gap for, for investors. And some of the um, engagements we've had, one is on antibiotics. We, we, wrote, we got $2.2 trillion, this is just in the last two years, to write to 10 restaurant chains like McDonald's and others asking them what are they doing about antibiotics in their food supply chain. The interesting thing is, because we own them, they had to answer. <laughs> and, um, and, and they've all answered, and they're all um, taking it on board. And of course, it, you know, it's just one little bit in the ecosystem of consumer demanding, and all of us doing our bits and seeing it as good business. Um, the other engagement we've done is something on uh, sustainable protein. We got 2.4 trillion to write to 16 companies uh, like Unilever and uh, a bunch of others, um, asking them um, what are they doing about sustainable, because the math doesn't work as we talked about. And it's been, the response has been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal, the power. And I'm just going to say one other thing, because we all talk about business and individuals and governments. But, you know, the, 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 and, and then we've been talking about transparency, you know, looking down from up there onto planet, looking into companies wanting transparency, transparency of governments, etc. But, you know, the interesting thing that we've all sort of um, ignored in a way is that businesses used to be owned by the aristocracy, the church, and merchants. The really interesting thing is today, um, most of the you know, larger companies, all the public companies, are owned by, uh, perhaps you guys don't have pensions, but most people have pensions, are owned by the pensioners. Uni so McDonald's is owned by the pensioners, Tyson's, Unilever, all owned. It is the democratization of wealth in a way. And what hasn't happened is transparency down from all the individuals to see that they have so much power to push their pension plans into, um, into being more conscious of what, of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then one of the other, so that's one solution, fair. The second solution, solutions we've worked on is, um, is food technology. I'm now the largest food technology technology investor in the world. There are some amazing companies out there. There was a green revolution in the 50s. Today, there is a, a food tech revolution. So some of the investments, I'll just tell you very quickly. Perfect day is, I was stroking Buttercup the, a few weeks ago. Buttercup is a brewery. So what they're doing is fermenting milk protein. Don't forget, when you asked people, uh, if when Ford, you know, everyone knows when Ford asked people, if Ford had asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. And then you have a car. Milk proteins, why do it in the udder of a cow when you can brew it? It's exactly the same milk protein. It's amazing. Me and Lee Ka-shing invested, and now it's got, it's, it's taking off. Um, it's not in production yet. Another one would be, we, you had Memphis Meats. I'm, I'm also an investor in, uh, uh, amazing. Grow, you, you all saw that yesterday, those of you there. It's, it's growing meat. And uh, Modern Meadow is growing leather. Um, in vitro is, oh, Bolt Threads. I, did they present the other day? Bolt thread. I mean, brewing silk. It's amazing. And so this food tech revolution, you know, I was at a conference a while back, and they were talking about, well, we need it's so interesting how people are talking, because everyone's concerned now. Consumers are concerned about, um, 
about the food they're starting. I mean, I've got to give a, uh, a big shout out to uh, Founders Forum, Brent and, and particularly Johnny on, on this one, where, where they have, you know, what they've done is say, um, at Founders Forum, we will not have um, factory farmed food. And so what you can do as individuals, as individual businessmen, is say, I am not going to serve factory farmed food at events. It's a very easy thing to tell your event manager. In your businesses, you could do a meat-free Monday. If you give free lunches, don't give factory farmed food. If you're a foundation, I know there's some foundations in the room, I'm just going to say this. If, if you're a foundation and you're a foundation in the room, give conditional giving. So for instance, I gave a little bit of money to the Royal Academy and I was sitting there and uh, I was talking to the fundraiser, that one of the chairman, Mervyn Davies, my mentor of mine, so he twisted my arm. And, uh, and then I thought, fuck it, I, I'll make a condition, no factory farm food in your restaurant. Cost me, no, I was a winner either way. Either they do it or, or, or I save the money. And, <laughs> and, and I spoke to the fundraiser, she said, I don't think we can do that. It's not, it's, and so we wrote to the trustees and the trustees were unanimous. Why would we serve this shit? You know, and it's just, it's not rising up in people's consciousness. I gave some, the, in the, the, I said in my obituary there was a business school, so in the end I decided to do a business school at, uh, called Collar School of Management now at Tel Aviv University and gave it the mission to be number one in the world at venture. But we spent a year negotiating mm -hmm. that uh, it has to be a vegetarian <laughs> business school. Um, but you know, you c conditional giving can be very powerful. And if you're an individual, you can um, ask in a restaurant, is this factory farmed? You can just, or, and reduce your consumption. It's, there's lots of powerful things. We, it's, we all talk all the time about doing good and you know, moralizing and stuff like that. But we forget as individuals to, to act on it ourselves. Right. Thanks for that, Jeremy. And, and by it's the way, answer, when we sorry. organize conferences, we just ask people, if they want meat, please let us know. That's another way of changing the default. But, but Nick, I mean, you've been working in providing solutions, some of these kind of new alternative um, animal proteins. Would, would you like to say a bit more about how you came into this and what you feel you've achieved and where you feel the challenges lie? And also your kind <coughs> of your advisory role within the Good Food Institute and what, what you feel, you're, what gap you're filling there, as well as, um, as well as the kind of the business end of it. Sure, so um, one of the, the things I do which is relevant is um, myself and a few others started a venture capital fund called New Crop Capital that much like Jeremy and often with Jeremy and Jeremy's fund invests in co these companies in the food tech space. Companies that, if they succeed, will move, will reduce a portion of animal protein consumption and replace it with healthier, more sustainable, and more compassionate plant-based food consumption. And I also uh, helped co-found a nonprofit called the Good Food Institute. And basically, the goal of the Good Food Institute is to find market-based solutions to these climate change problems, these public health problems, these animal welfare problems. Um, on the nonprofit side, there's obviously a lot of good work being done to combat factory farming and switch public policies and public diets. But you know, we felt that there also probably were market-based solutions that would also help contribute to moving the ball forward. So if there were more companies being started, companies like the ones that Jeremy listed, the more of those smart, innovative, financially viable companies that can be brought into existence and supported so that they A, exist and B, thrive, the more we can move the markets and move society in this direction that, again, is better for the climate, the environment generally, animals, and public health. So in terms of what's needed in this space, um, there's a couple of things. So certainly uh, having more uh, venture funding for these companies w would be a, a good thing. But I think the number one most important thing is we need more people starting good companies in this space. Right now, I think, at least at the startup stage, there's really more money than there is really great ideas and people who can successfully execute on those ideas. So people, entrepreneurs, who see the financial potential in this space, and it is a space that is growing very significantly. It's growing about 8% year over year. 
that is projected to increase uh, in the coming years. It's a space that's getting more and more VC funding. So in the past five years, I'm not sure of the exact total, but it's something in the realm of over 500 million of venture capital funding has gone into this space. So from nothing. Yeah, but. from it's literally nothing, five or six years before that. So it's a space where there's a lot of financial viability and opportunity for entrepreneurs who have a really good idea that they can help make happen. And the Good Food Institute tries to work with entrepreneurs who want to do that. So if there's anybody here who has potential interest in this space, whether it's, that's an idea or just a, a general interest to learn more, uh, please chat with me afterwards. And the Good Food Institute would love to try to help you turn your idea or your interest into a viable company, help get it funding, and so on and so forth. Can I just pursue that? Uh, I mean, there's lots and lots of questions that spring to mind. This is absolutely fascinating. So I've got a few sort of challenging questions, as it were. So, f so first, there's just a question about the actual science, the technology. Is it there and needs a bit more push, or is it really still, would you say, quite embryonic? So that's the first question. The second is that I see this as very much a northern, a western, a developed country, approach to addressing global food security and environmental challenges. And there's always the risk that you, you give with one hand and you take away with the other. So in terms of, uh, a, you could call a kind of food imperialism in rela relation to the developing world. It'd be nice if you could comment T on Tara, that. Tara, can I, can I yeah. just say one thing, which is that, um, so, so what you're saying is that, you know, well, it's okay for you in the West to start being, you know, like in California, that meat reduction is dramatic. Yeah. And so, but but there's aspirations I in developing countries. Well, there's but jobs. At, there's jobs and, as and, aspirations and aspirations because what does it mean to be middle class? It means having having meat and chicken, etc., to a lot of uh, developing countries. But if the rich and powerful and wealthy aren't on t aren't on the cutting edge, who will be? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's a kind of it's a. I guess a, a trickle-down approach to, to addressing problems. I mean, I think I think the other question is: this is food tech, this is the industry, this is innovation. How can the regulatory framework help? How can governments help? And what is the role of civil society, who, after all, are the reason why we're actually thinking about these issues in the first place? Because they have raised awareness of the problems that we're facing. It's, it's worth noting that. Um is the Chinese government has got the most ambitious meat reduction program in the world. They have a target to get population-wide meat reduction in a way that no other government is. So it's, it's not, it, 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 may, it may not succeed in implementing yeah. that, but they have that okay. ambition. They have a stated ambition, which it, is beyond it, what we have. So mm. just to, if I may, mm. back up the social movement government role. They've issued their Dutch guidelines, which are very slightly different from how they were. But we'll, we'll discuss that another time. Yes, with it, within the Chinese government, there's a real focus on, on addressing food waste as well, I think. Yeah, so and do you want to say a bit well, about yes, that? Well, yes, I was going to just build on what you just said about social movements and, and their role. And I, I was at the Economist Impact Investment, How Do We Mainstream Impact Investment uh, conference yesterday. Fascinating. There was a great discussion at the beginning. And um, well, a, a, a debate, actually. And everyone in the room was invited to say whether they agreed with the motion that business and investment, not politicians and social movements, were the ones that we needed to turn to to save the environment. And the majority of the people in the audience, all investment community people, uh, were in favor of the motion uh, at the beginning. They thought they, their sector, were the big movers. At the end of debate, there was uh, an almost Theresa May-like swing um, uh, in favor of social movements and government. This surprised me mainly because, um, uh, well, firstly, I thought they would stick with their original view. And it seemed to open my mind that actually the business and investment community uh, are, are not as engaged with the power of the social movement. And that's where I've um, put my energies, most of my energies. Uh, you know, Like Jeremy, I see the food system as incredibly destructive. There is an optimistic side. We can use food, done right it can put carbon from the atmosphere back into soils. It can create habitat. It can sequester water into water reserves. It can feed healthy, nutritious food to everyone. It can do that. And uh, we are the ones that are in control of our food system, ultimately. As investors, we have bank accounts and pensions. As consumers, we create the food system every day through what we eat. And so how do we, uh, this is the question uh, that I kind of posed to myself, I suppose, age 15. Um, how do we make the food system that is so obviously not serving our long-term interests, and indeed our short-term interests with the whole public health disaster of overconsumption, 
how do we get the food system to align with our immediate and long-term interests? Um, well, social activation, mass mobilization around uh, this issue was the, was the way in which to do that. Get people who really care uh, and amplify their voice um, in ways that CEOs uh, and investors and governments can no longer ignore. We're being told we need to double food production by the likes of Monsanto. Um, the fortunate thing about this prescription, the productionist paradigm, if you like, is that it's not just wrong. Uh, we don't need to increase food production by that much. Um, it's also the biggest threat to long-term global food security, because by doing that, we will screw the planet. Um, that's quite an advantageous position to be in if what you want to do is take on a system that is built so fundamentally on a false premise. Um, and how do we expose that in a way that everyone can get, everyone can get on board with? Talk about climate change, deforestation, people find these distancing issues. I focused on the issue of food waste. Um, it's something that pretty much everyone can see, whether you're a taxi driver in Delhi or a CEO in uh, Silicon Valley, see a mountain of rotting food, um, and you think, well, well, there's something wrong with whatever system gave rise to that. So um, I, uh, I actually started when I was 15 collecting food waste for my pigs, ended up eating this perfectly good food myself, built campaigns around this, took media around the back of supermarkets revealing how much food they were wasting, eventually got around to writing the book about this. Uh, back in, and you, know, you have to cast your mind back a bit. Food waste didn't exist back then, at least people were not aware of it. Um, and then I wrote the book, calculated that at least a, w a third of the world's food was being wasted. That figure's now been adopted by the UN, the European Commission, and the rest. And uh, got all the data, the arguments, the evidence, blah, blah, blah. Not enough. Um, wanted to get this message out. Created the first uh, event, Feeding the 5,000 in Trafalgar Square, where we fed 5,000 people with food that would have been wasted. Um, that was supposed to be a one-off event, but suddenly supermarkets started donating their food, stocking ugly fruit and vegetables, doing all sorts of things. The government took on food waste, took on the supermarkets, wrote to them saying, we want you to cut food waste. It was an uh, amazing public uh, awareness uh, exercise. There was press everywhere. And we've had a 21% reduction in household food waste in the United Kingdom since then, and a whole load of other things. Um, and everyone said, Tristan, we're not going to stop there. Sure enough, we got countries all over the world saying, can you help us launch a national food waste campaign, which is what we've now done in over 50 cities. Pretty much every uh, inhabited continent, continent uh, we have won campaigns against food waste on. And the great thing about food as a way of taking on the climate, it's going to be about another 10 seconds, is that it's fun and it brings us together. And it's delicious, done in the right way. And so you can offer to people something that's inspiring, tangible, uh, and wonderful. And that's what we do with these big events. And more recently, um, to really hammer that point home, uh, I started Toast Ale. And we're getting bread that would otherwise be wasted, uh, brewing it into delicious craft beer. We've already started doing this in multiple countries. It's in supermarkets, et cetera. And it's kind of a message in a bottle. And it's a, the message is, look, if we want to defeat these systems that are destroying the planet, uh, we actually have to throw a better party than them. Um, because if we just tell them to shut up and quiet down and stop doing what they're doing, uh, they're not going to listen. But if we say, guys, there's a better party down the road where you can be having this hedonistic enjoyment of all of nature's bounty, uh, but actually do good at the same time, uh, and I, I they think will come. Tristan's got some that samples for a bit later. Oh, yes, you get to so, taste this stuff. Instead so of looking at the slides about it, you drink it. So, so returning to, um, so that, that's the kind of the good news. So sort of returning to to some of the risks and ways of overcoming them. So my, my question returning to the, the governance framework, where do you see the role of regulators and lawmakers in actually helping you advance your business? And also there's the kind of the artificial meat, naturalness, yuck factor, so you can, all that you can kind give an, of thing. You can give an example of Jerry Brown, the governor of the state of California, well, who's banned the prophylactic use of antibiotics in the whole of California from this year. And, you know, businesses need regulation, but sorry. Yeah, it would just be nice to know how you, how you feel, what you feel is needed to help the sorts of food tech companies that are out there that are trying to make a difference to make that difference. Sure. Um, I'm sure there's a number of things that governments can do um, just in this field, just like they can in other fields. They can provide more grant funding, more matching funding, things like that. For the food tech field specifically, I think the biggest potential risk is around labeling and regulation. So we all know there's, there's lots of plant-based foods that we all know and love and eat all the time, like pasta and cereal and rice and vegetables and so on and so forth. 
So obviously companies that can creatively package and market these in new ways that increase their consumption, there's no risks there. But with plant-based animal products like the veggie burger or something like that, uh, there's sometimes lab labeling issues that companies run into where they want to call something a burger and they're not allowed to. Or th that's not exactly the case, but it is the case for some other products like cheese and milk and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. So uh, labeling is one issue that needs to be overcome at the government level. And then with the so-called clean meats, meats that is produced in a, a clean factory setting instead of from an animal, that is an issue where there, there could be regulatory challenges. So to the best that GFI has looked into this, it seems like in the US, there's some work that needs to be done, but it's, it's not going to be a problem. There may be some additional risks in the EU where there are tighter regulations around how food is being produced. So that's one thing that needs to be addressed and addressed successfully. But like with, with all fields, governments can help a little bit. They can hurt a little bit. But if you build something cheaper, tastier, and more convenient, people will come. Like the, the public will come, and they will buy the products. And so I think the biggest challenge, again, is, is not so much engaging government, although there is work to be done there. It really is more people stepping up and creating or helping create companies in this space. So, so. yeah, just to, to finish, so for, for those of you who are, who are, are entre entrepreneurs, um, as you get to the end of whatever you are working with now, and you're thinking about what is that next project I want to take on, I would definitely suggest consider the food space. It is a space where simultaneously you can improve health in the developed world, where so many of us and our family members are literally eating themselves to death. You can fight climate change, fight cruelty, and of course there's huge profit upsides as well. So in addition to all the other good types of businesses that can be created, this is an area where you could do very well financially, and also really create a whole lot of change in the world around you. So we now have 1 minute 15 before we no, finish. We're, we're, we're not and following that time, are we, are, we? are we following that time no, no, or we not? We can, we can carry on. We're okay. Do a I've got... We're going to do Q&A. Uh, we, we, can, we can do it. Okay. Yeah. So um, I have a question, but I'll hold off. So why don't I open it up to whoever's burning over there in the blue? Thanks, Mark Saley. Um, two questions. One, what do you think about food banks? Uh, two, uh, it seems to me if you walk around the high street in the UK in the last couple of five years, the number of burger joints has dramatically increased. What are, where's the message not getting through to the young on this one? Mm. Uh, food banks are a symptom of the very system that we're talking about, the system that leaves a billion people hungry and two billion people overfed. They are at the same time an emergency relief for people who really need it. But if you think of the cliff that people are jumping off, those guys are the ambulances picking people up and taking them to the hospital. And it's important, vital, to do that. Uh, you also have to think about the people that need to build a fence at the top of the cliff and also find out why people are jumping off the cliff in the first place. And if you go and do your research and find that those people are actually jumping off because they're running away from a dragon uh, that is raising the ground uh, on which they lived, you have to employ a few dragon slayers. So what we try to do at Feedback, the nonprofit uh, that I've um, founded, is, yeah, we go and collect food that would be wasted. That's the emergency relief. But you use then that as a platform to reveal the original causes of overproduction, cosmetic standards, food waste, environmental destruction, to get public opinion behind and the resources to go and employ your dragon slayers to take on the dragon and teach them, uh, instead of eating everyone and killing them, to become the people that fly those people off the cliff and into a new kind of uh, haven of, of bliss. So, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's what you've got to do about um, food, uh, food banks. You've, you've got to carry on doing it, but you've got to build on that to take on the fundamental system that gave rise to it. And to talk about um, junk food things, I, I personally think, and I think this is true for sugar consumption, sodas, particularly ones uh, laced with um, caffeine, Coca-Cola and and Pepsi are the obvious ones, which we sell to children. I mean, sugar and, and a semi-addictive drug, perfect. I mean, you know, I've got this great business. We're going to sell that shit to kids. You're not going to give me any money for that now. Why do we even let that be allowed? But what we could do is do what we've done to tobacco. People are not buying the fizzy drink because of the stuff in it. I mean, if they knew what was in it, who would buy it? They're buying the brand. So take the brand away from these people and make them just as hidden from the public as the tobacco brands are now. Uh, y investing billions of dollars into these aspirational brands is, is the real problem. So, yeah, yeah, that's what I would do about it if I was the government. 
So another question, just, just one comment on the burger joint. That is also the role of policymakers in granting or not granting planning permission for different, different kinds of enterprises. And if you actually had a, a, a health or environmentally orientated regulatory framework, then, then that could actually shift things. Um, so James Pyer here. Um, I have a question about the food tech stuff that you guys were talking about. So my background is in biotechnology, and the biotech industry got started solving the same problem that the food tech industry is solving now. We took an animal product, which was at the time insulin, and figured out how to make it in microorganisms or make it in the, in the lab. Um, but insulin is a very small part of an animal, and meat is a very large part of an animal, and insulin was very expensive. By comparison, meat is very cheap. So how do the economies of scale using what we've learned in biotech apply to the food world now? And like, is that the key problem driving the price down because biotech is expensive and you're trying to do something on so much of a bigger scale? Yeah, no, I think you've, uh, you've hit one of the major issues. So Mark Pasta uh, announced a few years ago he'd made a burger, I think it was $300,000 or something. And uh, uh, Memphis Meats has got it down to about $300. They, um, within the next uh, 12 months, down to 100, and they're hoping by 2020 to have it um, cheaper than cow's meat. Well, it's been used in the medical industry for a yeah. long time, this technology, and uh, now it's just shifting over to food tech. Yeah, I just add on to that that yes, that is the main challenge for so-called clean meat. With things like plant-based meat, where you're making meat out of plants, it's not you know that issue no is issue. not there. But in terms of clean meat, clean dairy, yes, it's the challenge is now more of an engineering challenge of how can we drive down the cost. So for clean meat, some of the main challenges are how can we dramatically reduce the cost of the growth medium that allows the cells to proliferate and to grow and things along those lines. So yes, it's a challenge. It's, I don't think it's guaranteed that it will succeed, but there's at least a, a decent shot at it and one where the upsides are so huge that if we can get there, the fact that we can get there, I think makes the investment of time and money and energy in trying to get there well worth it. There's another interesting point that comes out of that though, because the cost is relative and uh, the, the industry is heavy, the meat industry is heavily subsidized. So for instance, uh, last year there was a avian flu epidemic in the US and um, it cost 3.3 billion out of a five, 50 billion industry, but the government paid seven, and you had to kill all the birds, and um, it cost 700 million of the government to restock all the birds, which of course is all our money because it's government. But that, the reaction of some of the businesses of that avian flu epidemic was, for instance, they, Compass Group, which serves 8 million meals a day in the US, 8 million, switched all of its mayonnaise because of the um, uh, volatility of pricing of eggs at that time. They switched all of their mayonnaise to um, a plant-based mayonnaise called Just Mayo, Hampton Creek Just Mayo. And uh, so the, the it's, it's happening uh, quite fast. One last thing I'd add is there's far fewer uh, restrictions and regulations in the food industry than there are in the biomedical space. So the standards of quality and, and things like that that you need, it does not need to be 100% pure and, and so on and so forth. Obviously, it needs to be safe and healthy to eat, but that also reduces the costs. Can you say a bit about, you know, GM uh, did not go down well with consumers, so the kind of Frankenmeat type thing. Do you, do you have any views on that? Sure. So... If we think about what is natural, it's not natural to take a living an animal, put it in a cage with a bunch of other animals for the entirety of its life, feed it grain that was grown a thousand miles away, force it to live in its, in its own feces, and genetically breed the animal over the course of many many generations to grow to a size that it would never grow to in in, in nature. Like that is the height of unnaturalness. Uh, so what? People like, like Uma from Memphis Meats who spoke yesterday are trying to do in producing clean meat is, and as Jeremy said, how can we produce the exact same you know, physical and chemical substance, like the exact same cells, without that cow in the middle, or that chicken, or that pig, or, or whatnot? And you know, GM is a, is a 
it's a related, but it's a, it's a separate issue. So, for which example, done, which by the way we've done on so many other products. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of products that every one of us are eating now that are produced using the exact same technology. Vanillin is an example. Uh, most of the vanilla flavoring we eat comes from uh, this exact same type of technology. So, so basically, For, it's about framing it in a way that the public actually gets that, that yeah. naturalness is a is slightly a bizarre context concept in this very strange world. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what we eat, what most of us are eating right now, is in no way natural. Yeah. So I think this is largely going to be a marketing effort of how do we get people to see that this is not only better for the world, but it's better for you because it's cleaner, it's safer, and it has it can have health advantages and so on. Okay. Um, can we, since we haven't got a great deal of time, can we take three questions and can they be short-ish questions? Three questions at a time. Short answers. So one there, one there, and is there a third? There's only two. So just a question. Um, so I've heard a lot of inspiring, I guess, insight on how food tech is transforming how we make and produce foods. What are your thoughts on the last mile? I mean, we can make food cleaner and potentially healthier, but what if consumers and us aren't really well educated on how we best nourish our bodies? I mean, at the end of the day, we're all eating food because it's the power to our engine. So if we're still uneducated about what to eat, how often we eat it, when we should eat it, a lot of the great work that we're doing could essentially be kind of diluted. So what do you guys think about that last mile to actually make sure that consumers are eating the right things so that obesity and diabetes and things like this can actually be positively affected? Okay, thank you. So and there was a question over there. No? Was there a question yeah. over there? This lady here. You. Go ahead and follow. Okay, so and th that gentleman over there, you, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Do you expect cows, chickens, etc., to survive this transformation? Okay, who wants to take the health education question first? I can jump in on that. So, I, you know, a lot of the work that I do is indeed trying to figure out how can we get people to A, understand these things, and B, make smarter decisions. And there is progress. I, I'm not so familiar with the UK data, but in the US at least, demand for uh, meat and animal products has, most animal products, has declined a bit over the past decade. That being said, it's, it's a relatively modest decline. So there's some progress being made, but it is an extremely, extremely challenging thing. I think the biggest hope for food tech is not getting a better alternative that sits on the shelf that well-informed consumers can then choose to buy if they are, have the, the discipline and desire to do so, but rather to make a replacement product that happens to be cheaper that companies are then incentivized to use instead. So for example, if we can get to a point where clean meat ground beef is cheaper than ground beef from cows raised on a factory farm, forget what individual, individual consumers are going to choose to do or not to do. Taco Bell, McDonald's, all the companies buying and using huge quantities of ground beef, they're going to switch to the cheaper and safer alternative. And so I think it's hopefully by building a better product that we get the big users, the corporations, food service, restaurant, and so on, to make the switch so that individual consumers don't have to make that choice every single time they make so a shopping And decision. if I could just jump in, um, I have plenty of health colleagues who tell me that absolutely everybody in the Western world is aware that we should be eating five a day, we shouldn't be eating sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Information is not the problem. They go off and do it anyway. It is exactly as you've pointed so, so out. Social media is changing. I mean, it, 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 I mean it, social media amplifies evil, et cetera, but it also amplifies good. And this whole point of transparency, I think, is, is coming through on, from social media. I think, I think we're educating ourselves. But, you know, we're starting to do that through social media. Uh, I'd like to speak up for the role of, of almost negative uh, campaigning as well. I, I think, um, you know, having cheaper, more convenient, more delicious alternatives, absolutely part of the picture, but mobilizing around some of the negative aspects and even regulating, I've proposed one, you know, not completely unviable regulation. You know, it used to be the case that the billions that the big corporations are spending on this crap and getting us to want to buy it, 
uh, was an unassailable power. I, I'm beginning to have some degree of hope that we in the world of you know, <coughs> mass mobilization can almost beat that power and create such a lot of noise about the negative impacts of whether it's factory farming or, or, or junk food or, or, or you know, sodas that you, you, we can take them on and we can bring them down. Uh, and that creates the space for the alternative companies that are, are, are doing the better doing the better thing. So I, I don't think we just give up and say, oh, well, you know, they're really powerful. We can't touch them. We go after them and, you know, use the banks, use the pension funds, use the mass mobilization and, uh, and, and use the governments where they'll be willing to listen. And they'll only be willing to listen when their electorate are shouting loud and clear about the fact that they don't want to pay taxes for a health service to clear up a public health crisis caused by the consumption of junk food, which has billions of pounds behind it, doing them, etc. So there was question about insects and the demise of the farmed animal. Who's going to answer that one? Again, mass mobilization behind the, p the positive uh, elements of insects, that's great. But in the same way uh, that you were just talking about Taco Bell and that cutting out the, the need to convert every consumer, one of the very immediate and clearly uh, uh, you know, implementable, and there's loads of businesses in this space, use of insect protein is as animal feed uh, which means you no longer have to chop down the Amazon rainforest. And there are lots of insects, black soldier fly larvae, for example, that will happily eat waste that can't be d used for anything else, turn it into insect protein. Now, cons customers in the West might be a bit picky and choosy and yucky about eating insects, but I can assure you pigs and chickens are not. And uh, so, you know, turn that into livestock feed. I'm not saying that's the only use for it, but that is one immediate, and, uh, you know, it's already being used in uh, agriculture and... and it scares me that we, we're... we're the in, the in, on the insect point, the only point is it scares me that we might create a plague of them. Well, yeah, I like the plague of cows. Mm. There was an old lady <coughs> swallowed a cow. Swallowed a cow because the cow ate an insect. But there's also the point that, again, you know, we're focusing on climate change, we're focusing on sort of Californian, the Californian perspective, but, you know, for example, Not insect so farming insects, yeah, has, yeah. Been, has been, has been, uh, has been uh, have been farmed. They've been eaten wild harvested, and they've been farmed in the developing world for in Southeast Asia for yeah. years and years. And one of the concerns of people who are working with these communities in Southeast Asia is that once you develop a sort of industrialized model of something like insect farming, you're taking the agency out of the power of poor people and smallholders, and you're actually you're you're, you're converting it into another top-down highly um, exploitative sector. So I do think that when we look at solutions, we also have to look at all the, the unforeseen perverse outcomes that, that aren't immediately um, obvious. <laughs>